I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Who said that? Jesus. In John 10, 10, Jesus said that. So if you're feeling hopeless, discouraged, you're feeling like you just can't go on, today is your day. This series is going to minister to you, not because I'm telling you so, but because Jesus has the Holy Spirit on assignment right there where you're at, right there in your place, making your place home. Let's ask the Lord for help. Precious Jesus, you have the precious Holy Spirit on assignment in our lives to reveal, to disclose, to unfold the word of God, the treasure map of life into our life. So Father, we believe we receive your help by your precious Holy Spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Say that right there in your place. Amen. We receive it. This series we're in Jesus. We're in Jesus part three. We're going to specify and zone in on the king and the priest. Jesus is the king and the priest. God the Father is honored as we investigate the true identity of his son, Jesus. I hope you're beginning to see a pattern in this series. We are pursuing the knowledge of who Jesus truly is, and therefore, we are coming to know the power of the name of Jesus, the identity of Jesus. That's his true identity in his name, Jesus. The better you know him, the better you know you. Thomas Jefferson once said this, do you want to know who you are? Don't ask, act. Action will delineate and define you. But I disagree with Tommy Boy. <laughs> Historians say Mr. Jefferson believed in Jesus as a good man, but not as God. Therefore, our identity would always be in bondage to our own performance, our own ability, and not Jesus' saving, redeeming power, his work at the cross. And that, my friend, is hopeless. I'm going to say something shocking to you right now. You may have heard that, well, it's all about Jesus, and that sounds good. But the real good news is this. It's all about you. Oh, I can hear a few Pharisees and religious zealots right now going crazy, treason, it's an abomination. <laughs> but listen to probably the most famous verse in the Bible. Listen to it again, John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him, Jesus, shall not perish but have eternal life life. If it was only about Jesus, listen to this, then God would not have sent his son to die for us. Why bother? If you aren't worth saving, why bother sending his perfect son to the cross? If there's no you to save, then God can just enjoy heaven, the angels, and his amazing perfection. But the truth is, God so loved you that he devised the most amazing grace plan to redeem you, my friend. Whether this makes you uncomfortable or not, this redemption strategy, this Jesus come to earth to lay down his life, his precious, perfect life, is all for you. Yes, Jesus came to give abundant life to you, my friend. Get that into your heart. Little six-year-old Anna, she said, Dear Jesus, Thanks for my baby brother, but I, I asked you for a puppy. <laughs> Jesus came to give you, my friend, true identity, to get answers to your prayers. The better you know him, the better you know yourself. Looking at the first Adam, we understand our original design, but looking at the last Adam, Jesus, we see ourselves as children of the Most High God. Identity decides your authority. We looked at Jesus as the lion and the lamb in part one. The duality of his character being both savior and sacrifice, the great defender and the gentle provider. These extremes, polar opposites, are not opposing but confirming his full power and energy of life. We learned in part two that Jesus is the son of God and the son of man. God injected himself into his own design to save us. Humus man, humus meaning dirt, 
earth and man being of the God class species of spirit, it's truly amazing. Like the songwriter wrote, truly amazing is our God, mighty in power, gracious in love. If we don't intentionally know God, we miss out on his heart for us. Jim Gaffigan once said this, the comedian. He said, do you think Jesus ever tried to talk God out of some of that stuff? You know, instead of that whole crucifixion, how about we do a big fundraiser? <laughs> no, a thousand times no. Jesus came to save us. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In this segment, part three, let's remind ourselves of why knowing Jesus is to our advantage. Let's see again what happens when we become acquainted with his identity. Look at John 1, verse 12. You know this is one of my favorite verses. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, that's Jesus, God gave the authority, the power, the privilege, and the right to become the children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. What name? The name of Jesus, the full identity of Christ. Even on earth, we understand that a name represents identity. Your ID card or your credit card is an association of numbers that ultimately should represent you, who you are, your credit. Now, the world system only goes so far. It's flawed. The world system is based on dirt and therefore mortality. It's an outside-in reference when God is inside out when referencing your identity. You get that? First Samuel verse 16 says that man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart from the inside out. So we don't want to just believe on a cultural fabrication of who Jesus is or a religious generation of his identity. There's no power in that because it's not authentic. It's not real. We want the full Bible representation of Jesus' true identity so we can have our true identity, guess where? In him. Jesus' identity as the king and the priest. Let's talk about this. Here's how the dictionary defines a king. One that holds a preeminent position, a person who reigns over a kingdom or empire, a sovereign ruler of a territorial unit. Now, if you've been raised in some form of democracy, the idea of a ruling king, it's pretty foreign except for what you've read in history books or even seen in movies. Throughout the ages, kings have come and gone, but without exception, they rule over the people. The lesser, the people, serve the greater, the king. But 2,000 years ago, something amazing happened. A king was born after a spiritual royal lineage and a human kingly lineage. He was born of a virgin and the angel told Mary to call the baby boy Jesus. Now, even the constellations, listen to this, even the constellations spoke of his arrival and triumph over darkness to his forefather, Abraham. That's right. God told Abraham to look out at the stars and the English translation of the Hebrew is to see if you can count the stars, but the accurate translation from the Hebrew language is see if you can tell the story of the stars. What story? the story of Jesus. Look at this, Virgo is the picture of the virgin bringing forth the seed, the desired one, Jesus. Libra is next, a pair of scales of justice and below a cluster of stars depicting the slain lamb and beside the lamb, another cluster of stars called the Southern Cross. It's the map of forgiveness, Scorpio. The man holding a snake and stepping on the scorpion. It's Jesus, our champion. Then there's Taurus, the mighty bull who carries the weight of humanity with a cluster of seven stars in his hand. Now remember this. Remember what we talked about in part one that John saw in the book of Revelation? He saw Jesus holding the seven stars in his hand. And then finally, the last arrangement in the constellation is Leo. Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Royalty, representing royalty. The cluster of stars under Leo's foot is Hydra, the snake being crushed by the lion. The king, the regal royal king of eternity has won the victory for mankind, the species of man. 
Yes, even Abraham saw the story played out in the stars of Jesus the King, not coming to earth to be served, but rather to serve humanity by defeating Hydra, the serpent called the devil. Only a righteous king could defeat the devil. But that wasn't all. Only a royal priest could balance the scales of justice and restore righteousness. So let's talk a little priestly talk for a moment. Because this is critical to your design. Hebrews 7 verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the law. Why was it further necessary that there should arise another and different kind of priest, one after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one appointed after the order and rank of Aaron? That's the question. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus was and is a different kind of priest under a unique order. All Hebrew priests were assigned to come from the tribe of Levi. But long before the Ten Commandments and the patterns of the tabernacle with all of those sacrifices of the lambs, Abraham met a man coming back from war to free his people. He met a man named Melchizedek, who was king of Salem, later called Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? And he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, here's the thing. The office of king and priest were always held by different people, different tribes, never even the same person. But this Melchizedek was totally different. He was a royal priest. He was both king and and priest at the same time. Abraham instinctively honored him and gave an offering to him without even being asked. And here's the other side of that. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Think about that. Melchizedek had the power to bless Abraham. The priest of God has power to bless even the great patriarch Abraham. The greater blesses the lesser. Jesus is powerful as both king and priest to save you, redeem you, restore, and bless you. Isn't that good news? The role of the priest is this. He's the mediator between God and man. The priest is the bridge between God and and man, think of Jesus with his arms outstretched between heaven and earth as the mediator between God and man. This is why the cross is the picture of the ultimate bridge, the laminin that God uses to successfully restore our relationship with him between mankind and, and God Almighty. Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 says this, And now they sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it, for you were slain, sacrificed. And with your blood you purchased men unto God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom, listen to this, royal race and priests to our God, and they shall reign as kings over the earth, priests and kings. Three days after Jesus died on the cross, he was buried. He rose up from the grave. And one of the first people he meets is a woman named Mary, not his mom, but a disciple named Mary. Think of it. He's on his way from the grave of man to the throne of God in heaven. And he stops for a moment to talk to this precious woman. And in John 20, verse 17, Jesus says to her, Go tell the other disciples that I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So just imagine now the heavenly scene that follows because Hebrews 9, verse 24 says that Jesus appeared in the presence of God for us. To do what? Into heaven's courts. Before the presence of Father God comes Jesus. He's wearing his priestly white robe. He's carrying something though. The elders, the angels, the seraphim, they all go perfectly silent. Even the thunder and the lightning around God's throne go silent 
and still for Jesus. The smoke dissipates and a hush overtakes the heavenly realm. Jesus, the Son of God, the priest of God, comes boldly and victoriously into the holy place. Every eye in heaven is on him. The champion over death, hell and the grave has arrived and he's carrying something. He is carrying a basin, a bowl of his own precious blood shed on the cross of Calvary. It's perfect blood, sinless blood. And his blood is speaking, it's crying. You know, Adam's son, Abel, he was murdered by his brother Cain and his blood never stopped crying for vengeance on earth. But now there's a new sound in heaven. It's the sound of the high priest Jesus' blood crying, mercy, mercy, mercy. Even when Lucifer the devil tries to accuse mankind and tell God of all of our failures, all of our wickedness, all of the, the, the downfalling of humanity, Jesus' perfect blood, his sacrifice is crying, mercy, mercy. God chooses to remember your sin no more. Why? Because he accepts the perfect blood of his son, Jesus. God no longer sees us distant and far away, separated by our sin. He sees that our mediator, the high priest Jesus, has brought us near by the cross and God hears the blood testimony crying, mercy. Your identity as a royal priesthood my friend, you've got a new identity. So we see clearly that Jesus came as both king and priest. Two high office positions critical to who Jesus is, but also essential to who you are. Yes, this matters to your destiny and your identity. Again, Jesus didn't come to only deal with our sin problem. He came to restore our identity. So we must know and understand the office that King Jesus holds. Now we're putting two and two together, aren't we? When we hear Jesus is the King of Kings, we understand that's Jesus, but we also are hearing that it's talking about you. Jesus is the King of Kings, not of fools, not of sinners, not broke down losers. Jesus is the King of Kings, royalty, rulers. That's the real you. That's destiny calling. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, listen to this. But you, you, my friend, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, that's you, a chosen race, a royal. Get that word. I want you to get it in your heart. Royal priesthood. You see, in a worldly order, priests can never be royal. It's a separate, distinct office as a mediator. Royalty, on the other hand, strictly belongs to the ruling class, not servants. But you, you are called to be a royal priesthood, a chosen race in Christ Jesus. When you're in this special position, you get to set forth God's wonderful deeds, display the virtues and perfections of God who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. But without getting too heady, can you imagine doing any of this if you choose to live outside of this position as a royal priesthood? Or if you divided the position to be either or? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. You cannot divide God's plan and you definitely can't divide Jesus, but some people try. So look at the significance of these two authority positions, king and priest. The responsibility of a king is to rule, govern, and enforce the laws of the kingdom. The role of the priest is to mediate to connect or bridge the gap between God and humanity. That's why Jesus with his arms open wide on the cross is such a perfect picture of the mediator, the priest. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, a kingdom, not a democracy or a theocracy. He didn't come preaching religion or spiritual property management. No, 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 only the kingdom of God, the system of God. Pilate, 
a governing ruler of the Roman Empire spoke with Jesus just before the master went to the cross. John 18, verse 37, Pilate said to him, Jesus, then you are a king? Jesus answered, you say it, you speak correctly, for I am a king, certainly I am a king. This is why I was born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, who is a friend of the truth, who belongs to the truth, hears and listens to my voice. Listen, the ability to hear and to be in sync with the truth determines the activation of the truth inside of you. If you only allow the knowledge of Jesus as the priest in your heart, you dissect the truth and make it impossible to fulfill your calling as a royal priesthood. You see, the priesthood serves while royalty reigns. You're called to be like Jesus, to love and serve one another, but to rule and reign over the stuff, the things, the systems, the mountains, the obstacles. Love people, rule stuff. Love people, rule stuff, not the other way around. Because of ignorance, Bible illiteracy, we've got Christians trying to serve and sacrifice and love the walls, the systems, the traditions of their faith, but then they demand that the people serve them by meeting their needs. When they fail to move a mountain being priestly, then they try to move a brother or sister by being kingly. That's being an immature tyrant. You've reversed the Jesus order. I said, we serve people, we rule the stuff. But here's the problem. When you fail to recognize your God design and that you're meant to rule the stuff, things like your own desires, your appetites, your thoughts, even your soul components like your desires, your anger, your, your passion, your emotions, when you fail to take authority over your inner person and don't rule that stuff, then you instinctively try to fill the vacuum by trying to rule over people even the people you love and you care about. Family trying to rule over family, spouses trying to negotiate for control. Religion is the worst at this. It tries to coerce people into action by talking sacrifice. And yet God says in Psalm 40 verse six, sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, nor have you any delight in them. God has no delight in them. Oh, Stephen, how in the world have we got it so wrong? Easy, easy. Look, we simply allowed the devil to trick us into a perception of role reversal. It's role reversal. The Lord still loves us, but as Shania Twain sang in her song, don't be stupid. I would add, you know he loves you. Don't be stupid. Now, by God's grace through Jesus, we even better understand this verse. Now, listen to this verse again. Romans 5, verse 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, you're called to reign in life, but that can never happen if you're still a subject to the kingdom of darkness. You can't reign when you're a slave to sin and the devil. You can't reign when you reverse the priest role with the royalty role. You're supposed to command mountains, not command people. You're supposed to serve people, not bow down and serve money and walls. Are you having fun? <laughs> this is so good. I'm having fun because this is kingdom of God talk. It's God's way, God's system. Colossians 1 verse 13. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness, thank God, and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. You're meant to reign with Jesus, but the first thing that must happen is you must be drawn to him out of the control and dominion of darkness. That's the work of the mediator, Jesus, the priest, Jesus. He opens wide his arms on the cross as our priest and personally becomes that bridge, drawing us out of darkness, but also transferring us into the kingdom of light. You are saved from, but you must also be saved for. Who gets on a bridge and just stays in the middle? Religious people do. Don't just get saved. Keep moving to the other side into your true identity. Too many Christians stay in the old time. Well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Look, my friend, be one or the other. 
come on over on the other side of the bridge. The more we study the duality of Jesus' roles, the more we understand ourselves in God's intricate design, making us in his image, in his likeness. There's something amazing about you. Forget the past. Quit looking at the optics. Even in your worst state, God loved you, saw that you were worth sending his perfect son, Jesus, to die on a cross, to be that bridge into his family, a royal family, to make you his chosen race, a dedicated nation. Yes, that's you. Why, oh, why do we argue, fuss, and fight about our genetics, our nationality, our background, when God has always destined you for an identity transfer into his kingdom of royal priests? Why would we argue over this other earthly stuff? You can be the poorest prisoner or the richest CEO, but without Jesus, you're still lost. You're outside your true identity and going into an eternity of darkness. You need the bridge. Now, how does your identity as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, affect your life? Let me start by saying this. Most of us live way below our true calling as a child of God. Don't let that discourage you. J.K. Rowling once said this, the truth, it is a beautiful and terrible thing and should be treated with caution. But you know what? Jesus is the truth. Knowing him, the truth sets you free. Don't be afraid of it. When you hear truth, like in the book of Nehemiah, God said, don't be sad, don't be mad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, taste and see that God's truth is very good for you and the Lord is very good to you. That means good news. You've always hoped and wished that God had more and he does. Maybe you've been a Christian for 20 years and you're just beginning to realize there's way more to Jesus than I once thought. Well, praise God. You've just realized that there's way more to you than you once thought, right? The enemy needs us ignorant. The less you know, the less you go. Bible illiteracy is the devil's only hope to stop you. That's how powerful you are in Christ Jesus. The more you willingly flatten out the dimensions of Jesus' true identity in your thinking, the more ignorant you are of the buttons on your own dashboard. I have a family member who would borrow my car, push and turn every button he could trying to figure out what they all did. Afterwards, it would take me 10 minutes just to get the car so I could drive it again. But think about it. Many people, even Christians, are ignorant of their dashboard because they're ignorant of Jesus' identity as king and priest. Therefore, our ignorance keeps us living far below our identity and strangers to the activation buttons on our own life dashboard. If you try to reign in life without being subject to the King Jesus, you easily fall into the trap of being domineering, finger-pointing, bossy, yeah, even on social media, even tyrannical and possibly abusive. The King, Jesus, teaches us how to rule over the stuff, not the people, but the stuff, the systems, the elements, the molecules. Then, if you're trying to give and serve without being led by the example of Jesus as our priest, you easily fall into the religious pride, vain sacrifice, self-hatred, even self-mutilation and just pure hopelessness. Jesus came for you to have life and life more abundantly. So rich or poor, CEO or fruit picker, president or prisoner, mom, dad, son, daughter, we all need to know the king and the priest, the one man, the son of God, Jesus, the Christ, because we're all called to a family of royal priesthood. Yes, life must be mastered and ruled. On the other hand, people are opportunities to love and to serve. Every wave of circumstance must be governed with power and authority. Every person is ground. God has given us to sow seeds of his love, his forgiveness at times, his mercy other times, his kindness, empathy, tenderness, understanding. Jesus is the King of Kings, but he's the Lord of Lords. He's the high priest of a family of royal priests. It's time for you. It's time for you to be fully you. That comes from knowing Jesus. Why wait for life? 
Why would you put off not dying? Why defer identity to a cultural trend that you know it won't age well? This is not going to age well, what's going on right now. There is an anti-science surge as society tries to manage its dysphoria, but you don't have to go along for that ride to destruction. Jesus is the king and the priest. He's here for you now to give you everything that you could ever need, desire, want everything you could ever hope for. Now that's life. Pray with me. Let's pray together. Jesus, I need you. God the Father so loved me that he sent you to save me. You died on the cross, rose up from the grave. You are my high priest. You are my king. I'm a child of God through you. Give me the kingdom, Lord. I want to live for you. I pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.